will you join us in the salute to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call, please. Please note for the record that all council members are present. Thank you. And we have the adoption of the agenda. Are there any deletions, additions, changes? I'd like to um, add to close in memory of both uh, former Mayor Cy Bolagoff and also uh, Harold Ham Marshall, yeah. both longtime Brisbane citizens and a lot towards this community, both of them, so. Yeah. Okay. And do I have a... Any other changes? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And that brings us to oral communications number one, opportunity for the public to speak. And I have no slips, but are there any members of the public who would like to speak on a subject that is not on the agenda? Yes, that's on the agenda. Mm -hmm. So seeing none, we will move on to presentations and proclamations. And the first presentation is the rece official receipt of the new Brisbane history book. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. It is my pleasure to present to you our newest edition of our history, um, Brisbane City of Stars, our 50th anniversary, the second 25 years from 1986 to 2011. Um, this book has been um, brought together with participation with many of our community members, our council, of course, um, and we had the pleasure of having Adrian Kinane from History Associates put our history together for us. Um, unfortunately, Adrian was not available to come tonight. However, he did send me some comments that he would like me to read to the council and the community. <clears throat> Good evening and a warm thank you to Mayor O'Connell, city council members, and the council's history subcommittee for inviting me to participate in this meeting, albeit by long distance. More on that in a moment. Although I am honored to be included, I figure the last thing you need is long-windedness, especially by someone who isn't there. So I will quickly say three things. First, a thank you. Second, a congratulations. And third, a condolence. First, by way of saying thanks to all those who helped on this project, I cannot improve on the book's preface. Here are just the second and last paragraphs. Quote, it is not unusual for a city to tell its story by cherry picking points of pride, assenting notable accomplishments, and generally putting its best foot forward. It is far less common to do what Brisbane has done, undertake thoroughgoing research in service of a history that is accurate, balanced, and comprehensive. As author, I had the pleasure of discovering Brisbane as a city and a community, and of meeting many of its citizens, as well as the responsibility to listen attentively and write faithfully. It is no small matter to tell someone else's story. Through their city council, the citizens of Brisbane extend a great trust to History Associates and to me. We took that trust very seriously and hope that this history reflects the honesty and courage that commissioned it." Close quote. Among Brisbane's many honest and courageous people was former council member and Mayor Steve Waldo, to whom this volume of the city's history is dedicated. Steve served on the History Subcommittee, and I am thankful that I was able to speak with him at length before his illness progressed and he passed away in 2013. Steve's idealism was genially seasoned by dry wit and a droll sense of humor. It was an appealing combination that endeared him to citizens, to city staff, to his colleagues on the council, and, as the record shows, to voters. Second, congratulations. One of the reasons I cannot be with you this evening is that I am completing a cross-country move from San Diego to Washington, D.C., and I'm still moving into my new house. 
It is on Independence Avenue, just five blocks east of the United States Capitol. In times gone by, that location might have seemed quite an asset. These days, however, I am happy to have the buffer of the Library of Congress occupying two of the five blocks between my house and the Capitol. The library reminds me that the best government is not the one that governs least, nor the one that governs most, but the one that governs wisely. The one that looks to history for insight, not advantage. For self-knowledge, not self-congratulation. For understanding differences, not exploiting them. And for improving the boat we are all in, not celebrating our success in grabbing the best seats. History lessons are learned hard and forgotten easily. This book embodies Brisbane's resolve to remember its past and therefore to govern itself wisely. With much humility, no book ever gets it all, or gets it all right. I offer sincere congratulations on your admirable determination. I hope this account does it justice and serves you well. And third, I offer condolences to Bonnie Bologoff, her family, and the entire Brisbane community on the occasion of Sly Bologoff's recent passing. Sai's service to Brisbane was truly remarkable, spanning half a century and including four terms as mayor. Needless to say, Sai contributed much to this history. He didn't just extend the spirit of welcome and helpfulness to others, he exuded it naturally. It just came out of him, a byproduct of his instinctive neighborliness. And then there was that special twinkle in his eye. I never saw him without it. Now that Sai is gone, I am inclined to believe that his twinkle has not disappeared, but rises as a new star in Brisbane's hillside firmament. Surely those stars offer as much guidance and far more inspiration than anyone could ever hope for from a book. Still, I trust Sai would be pleased with this history. It would have been a lesser work without him. And so I offer thanks, congratulations, and condolences to all of you this evening. I will never forget you or what you taught me, and I am confident you will that you will continue to make great history together in Brisbane, your city of stars. With you in spirit and wishing you all the best, Adrian. It was very much a pleasure to work with Adrian. The only last thing I would like to note is that the history book will be available to the community, both at City Hall and at the library starting next week, if anyone would be interested in obtaining a copy for a small fee. Thank you. And I, I want to help thank the history committee that worked so hard on that and I believe that was Ray and Clark that worked on that and uh, put so much time and you, to you Maria for all the hard work that you put in to this and did, did either of you want to comment on this fine work? I, I know Ray would definitely I mean I <coughs> it, it's kind of funny um, you know, starting starting this project, you know, it went went from 1986 to 2011, and here we are in 2015, and just getting it out, and it took us, you know, four years plus to really kind of <coughs> get it together. And uh, uh, I mean, of course, we started on this long before that. I think in 2009, I believe. Uh, <laughs> and I would want to also make sure we mention Fred Smith, who really started this project along with the subcommittee. Yeah, and so it was a uh, long time coming, and then uh, we got the first copy. The first thing I looked at was our Library of Congress number, and it wasn't on there. And that was one of the things. <laughs> oh, man, what happened? You know, it's like, We're so close. <laughs> I know. <clears throat> and it was one of the things that we uh, had specified for it, so I don't know how we're going to deal with that. But Actually, uh, they did provide us with the numbers. They do have it, and I can. Um, we have the information so that we can send it over to them. Um, all we need to do is put a barcode within the back of the book. For them. Stamp it inside or something? Yeah, okay. All right, well, that's good. Anyway, a um, lot of effort and work and revisions and, you know, culmination and everything like that. And there's probably still a few mistakes in there, so <laughs> I'd be willing to bet. Right. Mistakes and interpretations, <laughs> you know, always part of history. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm talking about, you know, little yeah. typo type things. So. Yeah, I just also wanted to echo Clark's words of, you know, thanking everyone who worked on this. I know that the first two history books really are incredible in terms of the amount of information they contain and really conveying a sense of who we are, um, which really informs, you know, what we, 
you know, where we came from will inform what we are and, you know, where we will go in the future. So I think it's a great gift to have these books um, and to be able to share it with, with the citizens of Brisbane and, and other communities to really capture um, <coughs> the history of Brisbane because it's, in, it's pretty, um, you know, an amazing history. And so thank you for all for working on this. And also I did want to note, um, just um, not related to this, but when we did go over um, oral communications, I know there's an item not on the agenda that um, a member of the public, I mean, uh, on the agenda that a member of the public would like to speak on, but he will not be able to stay until that item is discussed, so, um, because um, of the small children. So I, I would ask that um, you allow that to, um, that person to speak because he won't be able to wait until it actually comes onto the agenda. Okay. Just, just one other thing to add, if I could, real quick, for Ray, um, because in the beginning of the history of Brisbane, there was a lot of tumultuous stuff that happened, a lot of recalls and everything like that, and this second 25 years started out that way but the last 20 years it has been very stable and you know we've gotten a lot of stuff done during that period of time good things for the community a lot of community amenities and stuff so it's been a, a real stabilization period i think for for us as a city mm -hmm. and i think one of the best reflections that we had was just recently at uh, um, the Council of Cities Conference in San Jose where Brisbane won uh, the first Gold Beacon Award for sustainability practices. This is all the cities in the state of California. And it's, uh, uh, we're the first recip recipient of a Gold Beacon Award. And that's something to, mm -hmm. to really be proud of. And San Mateo County has really shown its leadership. And, and Brisbane was really kind of at the top of the list. So. Uh, that's something. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to add that uh, I hope people get a chance to read the history because it is a good read because mm -hmm. it really gives you a sense of all the processes of politics and of agreements and disagreements and big issues that have been resolved and how they were resolved and so it essentially gives the story of, of Brisbane in, in a very interesting way, I think. And we've been fortunate to have really good writers to, to help us with that. And so it's a good read. Uh, I think the, it's being distributed to all the people who uh, participated in the process. I think there were about 50 who were interviewed and, and others who helped out. And I think uh, um, it is available in various public places, but I think also it's available, I think, did we agree on five dollars per, per per copy for people who want to buy them? And it would be a great Christmas present. <laughs> so I hope people buy a lot of them and give them. Uh, and I've been fortunate myself to be a part of actually both history projects. Uh, I was a part of the history committee with Fred Smith for the first book, uh, and then Fred came back, you know, to help us with the, with the second. Uh, and then, of course, Steve Waldo was a part of the process as well. Um, and so we really did try, and I really appreciate Adrian saying, uh, we really did try to, to give an accurate and balanced picture. You know, and we, we haven't done everything right through the years, and that comes through. Uh, and we certainly didn't do things right in 1989 when we had the recall, and that was a, that was a bad time. And uh, we lived through it, but it wasn't fun for anybody involved. And I think Clark is quite right that Brisbane has really evolved since then and uh, you know the level of civility because uh, i was here in the in the 60s and i mean it's just night and day between what council meetings were like i mean you you wouldn't believe i mean it was basically like a barroom ball, brawl really <laughs> uh essentially and and people didn't mind what they said and uh, there were things that you'd not want to hear in sunday school uh and some people had too much to drink and it, it, i mean th th things have really changed i mean <laughs> you are co guys now. <laughs> i mean that didn't happen in those days uh so brisbane has really changed and one of the um insights you get to that evolution is you know you're reading the two history books and you get a sense of you know what's happened in 50 years and you know brisbane is in some ways it's the same but in other ways it's very different 
And so I hope everybody gets a chance to, to read it and give it to all your friends and neighbors and relatives uh, and let the world know, uh, you know, what Brisbane is and what we've been trying to do. And, and, and some of it is our accomplishments, in fact, as Clark said. So we can be, I think, proud of that. So thank you, Maria. Thank you. And I do just want to mention also, if anyone is interested, we do still have copies of the first 25 years book. Um, if, they, if anyone is interested, they can come down to City Hall for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maria. So um, on the request from Council <coughs> Member Liu um, to have uh, Dr. Raymond Liu speak mm -hmm. out on the smoking ordinance, but just before I invite him up, I did want to give um, another item that we missed, and that's the report out from closed session from our Deputy City Attorney, Stricker. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, the uh, council met in closed session um, before this meeting, and um, the report out from Council is that Council has directed staff to um, enter into negotiations um, to uh, potentially reacquire Parcel R on behalf of the City. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And Parcel R is the par one of the parcels out at Sierra Point that has been um, the big dirt pile out at Sierra Point. So just to clarify it for the public. Thank you. And with that, I'll ask Dr. Liu to speak on an item that is on the agenda later, um, <clears throat> the smoking ordinance. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak uh, at this time. I, I have two young kids, so I, I really, really do appreciate that. Um, I'm actually here to speak. I did try <coughs> a couple of, I think it was about a month or so ago, um, and I do feel like this is such an important issue for me that I do want to speak to this again. Uh, I know it's on the agenda today. Um, I come to you not only as a, as, a, as a resident here, but also as uh, the Chief of Oncology at Kaiser San Francisco, uh, where I um, take care of a, a practice of, of uh, oncology patients. And I did mention last time already that every day I see the ravages of smoking. There is no question in my mind, there's no, no question in the scientific community that smoking is harmful for human health. And I did want to actually say that. I know it sounds very, very basic. Um, but I think we do need to say that because um, on social media, on several sites, um, there are apparently some, a lot of misinformation about smoking and in relationship to this ordinance. So I do want to first say that smoking is absolutely uh, uncontroversial. Uh, there's no controversy about this. It's, it's harmful for human health. Um, and so what we need to talk about also is the ravages of secondhand smoking. So we know that smoking um, uh, is allowed in America, and um, so a person has a right to harm their own health. But the real question now comes that we know also that secondhand smoking is harmful for human health. There's no question about that either. And so if we're talking about secondhand smoking and what it's doing to others in the community, we really have to talk about uh, public health. We really have to talk about not only the rights of the smoker to harm their own health, uh, but also the rights of the people around them. And so in a, in a, in a place where you're, you're in much tighter quarters, when I do have to ask, you know, when we think about the rights of a smoker, we also have to think about the rights of, let's say, a, a mother a, with a child with asthma who's living next to the smoker. That smoke actually gets right through the walls. It goes right through the, the carpet or whatever. You, you know, a lot of times the f folks living there don't have... Um, uh, the ability to move to other places. And so the, in these multi-unit dwellings, it is actually very, very important for us to do whatever we can to protect human health and safety. So as we sort of weigh these, these discussions about what is more important, the rights of a smoker, the rights of uh, people around them, I think um, I do want to just emphasize that smoking and secondhand smoking absolutely is harmful for human health. So that's the first um, element. Um, in relationship to clean air, I think we, you know, I'm, I'm definitely going to buy that book um, about uh, Brisbane history. We, we've read all the other ones and, and really, really love them. Um, but I think one of the characters of Brisbane is its, its, its dedication to clean air and the environment. And again, again here we are talking about smoking. Is, is there any reason why we should be um, uh, thinking about the rights of smokers versus the rights of, again, not only human health, but the environment? 
Uh, the second point I want to make that there's a lot of information out there about e-cigarettes, and I think the public is actually not very well informed about e-cigarettes. So I want to talk about the, the medical, sort of what the medical community feels about e-cigarettes, which is that we do absolutely do not prescribe it as a smoking cessation device. Um, I know people are using it for smoking cessation, and, and it may be used for that, but in reality, it's not being used for that. In reality, what it's being used for is to market to children to allow them to get addicted to nicotine and other substances that you can put in these, these electronic cigarettes. And so it would be great if electronic cigarettes were regulated to the point where we can only use them for smoking cessation, but that's not the situation now. There's absolutely no regulation over them. And so what, again, what e-cigarettes are currently being used for is to get um, new people addicted to nicotine. Nicotine is highly addictive, highly, highly addictive, and that's why I still um, in our local area, we have more than uh, one out of ten people still smoking. Um, every, people know it's harmful, but they're doing it because of the addiction, uh, how addictive nicotine is. And so e-cigarettes are, are not being used right now to get people to quit smoking. The, the data is clear on that. It's right now it's being used for um, other, other purposes. So um, there are many, many other ways when a patient comes to me and they're trying to quit smoking. and I, I do try to get them, to every single one of them, to quit because I tell them, even if you get cancer, your outcomes are way, way better in terms of survival if you quit smoking at the time of your cancer diagnosis. It turns out there's many ways we today can get them to quit smoking. Uh, nicotine patches, gums, counseling, all those things double, triple the quit rates. And again, I do not prescribe uh, e-cigarettes, nor do my colleagues. We, we don't do that. We have plenty of, of things to do to help them to quit. Plus, we actually created policies in our medical center uh, and across Kaiser that says that e-cigarettes should be treated like cigarettes. So you, you are not allowed to smoke e-cigarettes or use e-cigarettes on premises. So, they, so we treat them like cigarettes. Until they are regulated, until we know more about the safety uh, effects of these, of these devices, we, we have decided in the medical community to treat them as cigarettes. So I, I need you to consider that for e-cigarettes. Um, the next thing I would say is the last, last point that I've seen on social media is really about this marijuana issue. And um, I actually do talk about marijuana a lot with my patients. Um, practically everybody in the Bay Area, when they're uh, struck with this uh, cancer of, of many types, but especially the serious type, they start looking for alternative sources for treatment. And one of them to help with appetite and to help them feel better is marijuana. So we have, I have had a, many, many discussions with my patients about marijuana. And I will say that I never recommend anyone smoking marijuana. If they want to do marijuana and they want to use the medicinal benefits of it, I say don't smoke it. Why don't you try using dro droplet forms of it? Why don't you try, uh, you know, oils, things like that? There are many other forms of marijuana that can be used medicinally that do not need to be smoked. And so there are, there are some people that say I have to smoke the, 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 ah, the marijuana for medicinal purposes. You don't have to smoke it. There are ways to get the, the medicine part of it without smoking. And so from three parts, clean air, secondhand smoking, e-cigarettes, and marijuana, I think you can start seeing the picture here that uh, from my perspective, there's no reason to be smoking. There's no reason to be smoking e-cigarettes. There's no reason for us to be smoking marijuana. And we really need to protect the health and safety of our public, especially in these s smaller, tight-knit spaces of multi-unit dwellings. And so for us, I think if we want to protect clean air, I think if we want to protect our, our, our safety and health, we really should make as strict as possible these, these ordinances. Um, our, our future generations will, will thank us for it, um, and, and hopefully that will be written in the, in the in history's books in the future. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So with that, we will move on to presentations and proclamations. <clears throat> Item B, the Parkside Plan Community Pop-Up Event for October 24th. And are we doing an announcement? Good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council members. Um, it's my pleasure tonight to speak with you tonight briefly about the plan so far for the October 24th pop-up workshop that's being planned for um, the location being Old County Road at the bend right next to um, the signboard. So the um, consultants, MIG, have um, found this location to be ideal based upon the fact that in various um, pop-ups that they've done in other communities, they have found it very helpful to be able to physically stripe the roadway with a temporary chalk, spray chalk, so that those who attend the workshop can 
either ride their bikes down the bike lane that they're going to include in the temporary chalking um, to really have an experiential feel for a different uh, striping. And they're going to have three different striping zones at that bend on Old County. Um, the roadway would be closed, therefore, from the crosswalk right outside the Brisbane Village, um, uh, just directly north of the exit and entry to the village, so that it'll still be accessible to traffic from Bayshore, and all the businesses will be accessible. And the closure will go around the bend to the crosswalk at the skate park or park lane. So some of the things that have been planned so far, I'll start with some of the kids' activities first, is that the library, uh, they did a story time at Day in the Park. Um, they're going to come back for story time from 10 to 10.30. 10 o'clock is when the workshop starts. And I did place some uh, flyers in front of your um, chairs there on the dais so that you can see what we've been um, posting on our website and Channel 27 social media and other publications. Um, so story time is from 10 to 10.30. And this is on the kid or the family friendly version of the flyer that actually went home today with the Thursday packets to all the parents at BES. It's the one that has family friendly in orange. And then there's a picture of um, Captain Jack Spare Ribs. He is a former that I guess is very um, sought after. And he is going to be performing after story time at 11 to 11.45 in the kid zone. The kid zone will also have a uh, the antique fire engine parked on Old County. There's going to be an area for a mini pumpkin decorating with stickers. And there's also going to be, of course, the adult activities. So there's going to be music from um, 10 to 11. And then after um, Captain Jack wraps up from 11.45 to, till 12.30, which is when the workshop concludes. And um, there's going to be lunch. The uh, consultant is going to provide food from Melissa's Taqueria. And of course, there's going to be feedback stations throughout the, um, the road to uh, get direct feedback from community members on their thoughts on the entryway to town. So of course, there has to be a lot of coordination for such an event to take place. And we have worked with, of course, our fire and police and public works departments on uh, just to ensure that this is going to be a safe event. Uh, the police chief is here, and you can um, ask her more if you'd like. But she's planning on having two officers stationed on either side of the closure for the duration of there being activity in the roadway. And there's also going to, um, so the roadway itself will be closed from 8 a.m. to allow for setup time before the workshop at 10. And then they're going to do a quick breakdown from 12.30 to 1. But the police will be on site to help direct traffic until that area is cleared, maybe until 2 p.m. Um, also, you might be aware that that same Saturday is the same day as the Lions Pumpkin Patch and the Flu Shot Clinic, which is that first flyer. And I've spoken with various members of the Lions Club um, who had expressed to me the concern about um, folks being able to come around the bend and see their pumpkin patch and stop and buy a pumpkin. And um, I don't think it was clear that Park Lane would still be accessible to gain um, to arrive in central Brisbane. And so I assured them that there would be signage at the intersection of Park Lane and Old County directing traffic. Here's where the pumpkin patch is. Um, and also, here's where the flu shot clinic is at the uh, sunrise room. So the flu shot clinic is from 9 to noon that morning at the sunrise room at 2 visitation. And the pumpkin patch is under the gazebo in the community park from 9 until 2 p.m. And the parkside pop-up workshop is pretty much sandwiched in between from 10 to 12.30. And some other outreach that we've done is 
The Flu Shot Clinic is in partnership with the County Immunization Office, so I've spoken with the program manager there who is coordinating with the Stanford um, flu crew who will be coming in to administer the flu shot so that their personnel knows of the road closure and the alternate route um, into town by via either San Bruno Avenue or Valley Drive. And I've given them maps of both routes so that they're clear. There's also going to be two uh, CMS or changeable message signs at the Christmas tree lot on Old County and Bayshore. One of them indicating that Old County is closed and to use Valley. And also that the Brisbane Village Shopping Center is still accessible because we want people to be able to have that information when they're about to turn. Um, this afternoon, myself and uh, a couple other staff members, we went to the village and also the businesses on visitation to pass out these flyers that are before you so that the businesses were aware of the closure and also of the um, various special events that day. And next week, the luminary is going to be dropping, the chamber's uh, publication is dropping and they're gonna have a flyer um, included. Um, we have also posted this information along with the Lions events on our website and our social media sites as well. So we're hoping that there's going to be uh, great synergy across the various events taking place in the same sort of location and time so that people can pick up their pumpkin, get their flu shot, and come and provide feedback at the workshop. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now. I, I have one. Um, did we look at closing Francisco, San Francisco Street instead of Old County Road to minimize impacts? Um, now the initial idea was Old County just because it is the main entryway into town and this is the premise of the precise plan to re-envision and look at what the entryway to town could look like. And the other question is either for the police or for public works, will San Bruno, or, um, uh, San Bruno Avenue be clear or will it still have traffic uh, closures due to the construction on the slope retention? It'll be accessible, ma'am. Okay, we've got one-way traffic controls today. Yes, and the last couple days, so I didn't know how long that was. No, we'll get it clear. We'll get it clear for that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from? Could I could I follow up? Of course. On that? Um, I, I hope that it, it's okay that we close Old County and you don't uh, miff a number of people. I mean, I can see why from a planning perspective, it you know kind of makes sense. Uh, but also, as you just said, it's the main entryway to town, and so you know some people might get a little pushed out of shape. So. It, I don't know how much planning has gone into directing people when they come from various directions, you know, make sure that they turn, you know, when they need to. Uh, like if they're coming down Bayshore, they, you know, they probably want to turn on Valley rather than wait till they get to Old County and have to turn around and go back. So I don't know, I'm just wondering, have, have all those various points of communication to drivers been uh, figured out? Is that all part of the traffic control? I don't know if it's a question for public works or the police chief. Well, sir, the one thing I can guarantee you is that there will be some confusion. I, I think no matter <clears throat> how far in advance we put out changeable message signs and no matter how many flyers we put out, uh, you know, there will be someone that, that doesn't get reached. That's unfortunately just what happens. But we're going to try and be very clear with the messaging that we're going to put out in the week prior as to identify where the road's going to be closed from the inbound location so that people will understand that just past the village you won't be able to go through there. And we will. And the reason why we are renting uh, two newer changeable message signs to place them out at the vicinity of Old County and Bayshore so that people from both the northbound and the southbound direction will get a, will get a message that says Old County closed beyond village or something to that effect, use uh, park use valley to park as alternate we'll we'll have that language figured out part of the reason we don't have it figured out right now is you have to get the machine that you're working with and see how many characters of text and how many lines of text and how many yeah. ways you can scroll through it. unfortunately right now we have a really really old cms changeable message sign that mm -hmm. that we've used a lot more 
uh, for public events, and it's so old that we get eight characters, three lines of text, and you get to flash it twice, and that's it. So you're really, really restricted. But we're hoping that the ones that we're going to rent will, will be a little more robust and we'll be able to get a better message out there for folks. Because mm -hmm. I, I was just thinking that you mentioned uh, that sign at uh, you know, Old County and Bayshore, but for people coming down Bayshore, I mean, they'd be better off turning right away at Valley rather than waiting until they get down here and realize they either got to go down to San Bruno or they got to turn around and come back. And so I'm just seeing some traffic uh, confusion, as you said. And so yeah. it would be nice to kind of reduce that as much as possible because, I mean, the idea is that this is supposed to be a, a fun, uh, productive, uh, right. useful community activity, and, and you don't want to undermine it with getting a lot of people miffed and blowing horns and so forth and so on. So <laughs> I'm just concerned that, you know, we, we don't uh, you know, have a, a traffic mess uh, uh, it's because we didn't think it through carefully. Enough. Right. No, I, I appreciate that, sir. That, that, that's a fair comment. I, I think my my initial reaction is, as we thought about that, is that the people who routinely come through town and who would know that Valley to Park is a good alternative would benefit from that sign, but they're supposedly, they're imaginably going to be seeing that message for three or four days in advance of it. Uh, my concern with posting the message for the people who are coming to town, like what I'm, in, what I'm thinking about, the folks that I'm a little concerned about would be more like the soccer parents that you know have kids on local teams but they live out of town. Right. They're going to see if we posted that, say, like across from the fire station, they're going to get there and they're not going to know what that means yeah. because those street names don't resonate with them at all because they know the way they come to town and it's always the way they come in. And so that's why what we've done instead is the planning department and I think Caroline have reached directly out to Parks and Rec and reached out to the different sports leagues and we're trying to get the messaging out that way so that so that they can blast that message out so people will know in advance. But undoubtedly, we know what's going to happen. Somebody's going to be listening to their to their travel direct, you know, message. It says turn right here, and that's what they're going to do. They're going to turn right, even with a changeable message sign saying the road's closed. It's right. they're, they're going to turn right because that's what they're being told to do by the woman in their speaker. Right. right turn here, right. and they'll get down there, and then one of Brisbane's finest will kindly give them directions on how they can get to where they need to go, and we'll turn them around. Okay, good luck. <laughs> Thanks. We'll need it, sir. <laughs> uh, Lori, want to go first? Sure. So um, I, I think this is great, the, the community outreach, um, and about how to tell people where to turn and where to go to get around the event, but what are we planning on doing in terms of signage for you know, people driving through who just haven't seen the messages until they get there. How do we show them, you know, this is an event we want you to come to. Please park your car. You know, kind of like the farmer's market signs today, you know, farmer's market today. Are we putting any signs out? If, if not, I'd suggest that we do that. Say, you know, <coughs> you know in you know, as few <coughs> words as possible, a community pop-up event, you know, happening now. You know, come come participate something to that effect. And I, I would imagine, envision seeing it, you know, at that intersection, the main intersection by the post office, so people see it as they're exiting, maybe at the corner right by the tree at the park. Mm -hmm. um, and then also for people on Bayshore coming from north and south by the fire station um, and, and at the, the intersection at, at Tunnel Ave. And then also for people who are going south, um, you know, maybe they get to San Bruno Avenue um, and they're going to turn right into town instead, maybe put a sign there as well. Just kind of all the entrances into town and the, the exit as well. Well, I, I think that that's a good idea. I'm just wondering if we're trying to attract people not from Brisbane to think that there's some sort of fun fair for other residents instead of aren't we trying to attract just mostly Brisbane residents? Right. So my thinking is if they're planning on coming into Brisbane rather than just directing them on how to get in the proper way, you know, traffic-wise to, to say that it's closed because this event is happening and we want, you know, we're inviting you to come. You know, not just advertise the free food, but say, you know, come, re, you know, re-envision this Brisbane entryway. Um, somehow put the message in the sign as well. We'll see with how many characters yeah. <laughs> we get. And also the uh, sign board on Sunday night will have on the side coming into town the information about the pop-up and the closure. 
Um, it'll stay up all week through the event <coughs> and come down on Saturday <coughs> so that there'll be plenty of opportunities for people as they come into town to know about both the road closure and that the event is happening. Okay. I just got one question. Just probably shows my ignorance. What is pop up? Why? I mean, you it just popped up, or you know, <laughs> new lingo. <laughs> or you know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, why wouldn't it just called Parkside Plan Community Event? What's a, what's a, what does pop up? I guess it's attention getting. <laughs> they're oh, going what? attention getting. It's a pop up. Like they're going to have display boards. Um, they'll be fairly large, as I assume, and also. Uh, different than just a workshop where we typically have them here in our community meeting room, but pop up, I guess, is what they yeah. call their outdoor workshop. Yeah, I can speak to a little bit because um, because I was part of the interview process and I know we've also looked at this with respect to the <laughs> library they're considering doing this. So I guess pop up, from my understanding, is that it's an alternative way to get community engagement rather than a formal meeting. And that seems to be what um, you know, consultants are now using, um, you know, for various planning processes <laughs> to really rather than tell people to come to City Hall and come to a meeting at 7 o'clock at night and, you know, in a formal setting, instead we're going to bring the meeting to you where you're already at an event having fun and it's more mm -hmm. casual and so they call that a pop-up event. We just happen to pop up and <laughs> take a look at this? Is that it? Okay. Right. Well, sir, if I may, I think it also refers to the fact that they use those easy up tents or pop up tents. So I think they kind of borrowed the lingo from that. So because that's often what's affiliated with it. They're just like, oh, we're going to do it out here in a park. We're going to do it here on the street, and then it pops up. Not like toast, more like an easy up tent. <laughs> and then they blow away, as in at our uh, last <laughs> at the day in the park where the tents blew away. I, I don't have any questions. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm really excited about uh, the pop-up event. Uh, it's the first one that Brisbane will have. Now, there's supposed to be some others, too, uh, Carolyn, some other events. Yeah, that, there's uh, going to be more workshops planned for later in the year and early next year, I believe. All right. No, this is great. Yeah, you know, bringing uh, the, 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 the event, the, the workshop, to the actual site so people can really get a feel for what potentially could be the, the new entryway in, into Brisbane and how, how that uh, interplays with the existing uh, town, I think, is, is very exciting and, and uh, creative. Yeah. We heard a lot of um, feedback just talking to folks today when we were walking around. So we said, just come, say it at the workshop. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and it is important that people come to the workshop and participate because this, this is a big deal. And, you know, recently there's been a lot of, a lot of talk about, uh, you know, how many, how many stories and how dense the uh, potential development could be. And, 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 I, and I'm glad that you're having this presentation because it gives us a good opportunity to reach out to the community and just let them know that, the, the council as a whole and, and the planning commission as well uh, when we submitted our housing allocation to the state we were always looking at two to three stories 20 to 26 units per acre and, and I know that out in the public people are talking about five and six stories and 50 units to the acre and that that's that's false uh, we as a council have never talked about those types of, of densities and that um, this pop-up event is part of the precise plan, which is the city's plan and not the developer's plan. So that's why you need to be at the event and the other ones to provide your input so that whatever this plan becomes in the future, it comes from the community. So thank you, Carolyn. Sure. And one final question. You mentioned there was a schedule of events. Of events. Um, where will that information be posted in case people want to make sure they get there in time for the story time or the performance? Yeah, there's a post on our website right now, but I'll modify it as things get more um, concrete and... Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Carolyn.
that brings us to item C, um, Robert Maynard uh, from the San Mateo County Mosquito Abatement District. He's the representative and he's going to give us an update on disease and vectors. Uh, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council, uh, I understand time is short, so I'm going to abbreviate some of my comments. Uh, this year, as of September 30th, there were uh, uh, 245 uh, human cases of West, West uh, Nile virus in 28 counties in California. There were many thousands of more what they call subclinical cases where people think they've got a bad cold for a couple of weeks. Uh, there, were, uh, a pro there was a presence of West Nile in 36 counties in the state. Also, there were 36 mosquito pools positive with St. Louis encephalitis virus as well, uh, mostly in Southern California, and that's something new. Uh, in San Mateo County, as for the year as of September 30th, to date, uh, we tested 137 uh, dead birds at the district lab, and 10 tested positive for West Nile. Uh, they were mostly American crows, uh, and they were collected in Menlo Park, Redwood City, and San Carlos. Uh, we also uh, tested 182 mosquito pools. Uh, five were positive for West Nile. The closest one to this community was in Colma, uh, close to the shopping centers there. Uh, as, as of the 10 tested positive, uh, seven of the dead birds uh, were uh, occurred in September, which is interesting. It's usually a time when things start to die down. Um, last year, I reported that Aedes aegypti mosquito had, occur, had a, appeared in the graveyard in uh, Menlo Park, and it's taken um, essentially 18 months to try to stamp it out because they kept on re reoccurring. Uh, we this year, to date, we've inspected a thousand residential locations. Uh, in the, since July, we've we've found no more larvae, but unfortunately, it's hard to be 100% we've that we've eliminated eliminated them. Uh, those mosquitoes are carriers of dengue fever and yellow fever. Um, as I mentioned uh, last year, the uh, they arrived in the graveyard by a bamboo from uh, Thailand. Um, for September treatment statistics for uh, the county, we actually did 50,000 catch basins for checking for mosquito larva. Uh, we did 1,200 water treatments. Uh, we uh, inspected 708 uh, properties for Aedes aegypti, uh, we responded to 286 service requests. We ins inspected uh, 200 acres of marsh. Uh, we also treated, uh, treated one, excuse me, 21 acres of invasive cord grass in cooperation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, they have a strong desire to eliminate invasive sp sp spatial species and also uh, that type of cord grass is a uh, very good breeding area for mosquitoes. Uh, finally, uh, we uh, treated and removed 106 yellow jacket nests year to date uh, and we inspected 53 properties for rodents. Uh, five years ago, the county uh, just handed over rodent control, basically rats, to the district without the personnel or the minute money. Fortunately, at that time, we uh, were installing a new software program that enabled us to more effectively use our port personnel, and we've been able to accomplish taking over that responsibility with no additional uh, personnel. Uh, we feel it's been very successful. 45% uh, of the of the uh, bait stations that we've set up at sewers and other places that ro uh, rodents are likely to be at uh, 
had had the bait eaten, means meaning that we had put the stations at the right places. Uh, we also have uh, encouraged residents who have inquired to uh, to be educated to uh, use integrated <coughs> pest management practices, which uh, the don't stress the use of of uh, rodenticides, which are very poisonous, and instead block the entrances to their buildings with screen and and uh, remove food sources. Um, The uh, rodent program ends uh, at the end of this month, and it will resume next June uh, when the rodent population becomes more active. Uh, September 28th was declared World Rabies Day. Uh, to date, three bats in the county tested, tested positive for rabies, uh, and we really ur urge uh, people, if they encounter a bat, uh, or if their pets do, to uh, seek medical attention immediately because the death rate for rabies is, is 93, excuse me, 93 percent. Mm. So it's very serious. Mm. Um, the district lab uh, maintains two uh, mosquito colonies of Culex pipians, which are the most common mosquitoes, the house mosquito, uh, one for pesticide susceptible colony and one uh, a, a resistant colony. Uh, we also uh, raise uh, winter mosquitoes and uh, tree hole mosquitoes, and tree hole mosquitoes are very difficult to get rid of. Um, we have responded to 99 requests for pest identification, mites, fleas, uh, flies, bees, spiders, cockroaches, bed bugs, uh, Beetles. There's been an increase in flea problems. <coughs> um, we're developing a new program in collaboration with the San Mateo Public Health Department and nurses in schools for head lice management. Uh, we're uh, training school staff uh, uh, for surveillance, control, and prevention. Unfortunately, the st state legislature failed to pass a bill controlling bed bugs which is a growing problem in the county. Um, the uh, district continues to uh, control mosquito larvae in the county, of course. Uh, we have uh, 55 inspections of water sources per month in Brisbane. Uh, I, myself, this last Friday experienced mosquito bites on Visitation Avenue one evening last weekend and reported the experience to the district who uh, the next business day uh, showed up to try to eradicate it. Um, he found the source. Unfortunately, it's in a locked residence, uh, so he hasn't been able to actually get onto the property, which is a problem. Um, if you do see a lot of mosquitoes, please report the location to the district. Usually mosquitoes can be eliminated once the source is determined. Um, if you um, also, uh, you should contact the district specifically if you find dead squirrels or birds, if you are bothered in addition to being bothered by mosquitoes, and if you need mosquito fish to eat larvae in your home water uh, feature, uh, and if you find yellow jacket uh, nests uh, that are in an area that's a danger to your your uh, residents. As far as district operations, the finance reserve financial reserves are adequate to meet our needs. There have been complaints about, about the amount of money in our reserves, which were about uh, seven point one million dollars. But there's not was not a recognition rec recognition that we also had. A $1.8 million unfunded OPEB liability. We just funded that last night. Uh, we are also in a, engaged in a mem memorandum of understanding with the county retirement system to pay down our unfunded 
uh, pension liability, which is $2 million. So a lot of that $7 million disappears pretty quickly. Mm. Uh, we've selected a new auditor, auditor. And also I want to note that the parcel tax has not increased for the fifth year in the row uh, due to the strong economy. Um, we have a, a citizen science event uh, soon occurring on San Bruno Mountain with the assistance of San Bruno Mountain Watch. Uh, we're going to encourage individuals to collect ticks for us. Uh, we tried to do a, a, a tick count uh, two years ago, and because of uh, selecting the wrong time of year and not knowing where to go, our staff had great difficulty with it. So we're asking people to walk around with white cloths along the, the trails, uh, cotton cloths, and, and brush the uh, brush next to them and uh, accumulate ticks and put them on, in bottles. And then our, our, <laughs> our uh, I this district here. laboratory <laughs> analyzed them. Uh, there are uh, three types of ticks, and they carry a variety of diseases, not just Lyme disease, uh, relapse fever and a few others. Um, but we need to wait for wet, wet weather, so that will occur probably in January or February. Um, uh, finally, uh, this is the 100th anniversary on, in 2016 of the founding of the district, which is the oldest in the country. Uh -huh. And uh, I discovered last night that I'm the longest serving member now of the <laughs> board. <laughs> Apparently, they were dropping like flies after the fraud uh, that, that four, like years, four years ago. <laughs> like mosquitoes, yes. Um, and uh, we're going to celebrate by having an open house on January 6th in, at the district in Burlingame. And the public is invited. Uh, you can tour our facilities, our very ex extensive laboratory, which includes state-of-the-art uh, RNA analysis equipment. Uh, and our, uh, we have an airboat and an insectarium uh, for our mosquitoes. Um, and you also get to meet the technicians, including the ones who serves this district, uh, this community rather, and the scientists and the staff. Any questions? All right. Bob, I, I, I'd like to just thank you for your dedication for volunteering for this position for the many years of service that you have put forth. I know uh, uh, takes in your personal time and you seem to have a passion for it and you know and it's certainly appreciated you know thank being you. a brisbane resident so thank you thank you thank you Bob. thank you and lots of information i'm glad to hear we don't haven't had any reported cases of the west nile not virus not here. in this county and um, uh, but we do worry about those uh, aedes aegypti mosquitoes because uh, people who go overseas have come back ill with uh, tropical diseases, and if they get bit by those by those mos mosquitoes, they can start to uh, uh, transmit it again. Transmit it again. Mm. It happened to me last year. <laughs> Did it? Oh, <laughs> sorry to hear that. Yeah, spent okay, where you, where your deet? <laughs> and, yes, that's true. And I know I know where to walk and and pick up ticks on San Bruno Mountain during the right time of year. And oh, it does give me the, the creepy craw crawlies. You're welcome to join the crew. Uh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure I'm up for that, but we'll see. Okay, you thank got you. A volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Okay, hey, that brings us to item D, which is a proclamation um, declaring October 2015 as Fire Prevention Month. Would you like to speak sure, about certainly. this before uh, sure. or after the proclamation? It's up to you. Okay, I am just getting this, and I am going to probably paraphrase, and then you can fill in the blanks as we go along. And uh, whereas the City of Brisbane and California and the North County Fire Authority 
are committed to ensuring the safety and security of all those living in and visiting mm -hmm. Daly City and I assume Brisbane and the North County. Whereas fire is a serious public safety concern, both locally and nationally, and homes are the locations where people are at the greatest risk from fire. Home fires kill thousands of people in the United States each year, according to the National Fire Protection Agency, and fire departments in the United States respond to over 37,000 home fires. Working smoke alarms cut the risk of dying in home fires in half, and three out of five home fire deaths result from fires in properties without working smoke alarms, and in one-fifth of all homes with smoke alarms, none were working. And when smoke alarms should have operated but did not do so, it was usually because the batteries were missing, disconnected, and dead. And when smoke alarms should have operated but did not do so, it was usually uh, half of all home fire deaths result from fires reported at night between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. when most people are asleep. And whereas Brisbane and North County Fire Authority recommend and request residents to install smoking alarms, smoke alarms in every sleeping room outside each separate sleeping area and on every level of the home, and Brisbane and North County Fire Authority recommend and request residents to install smoke alarms and alert devices that meet the needs of people who are deaf or hard of hearing. And Brisbane and North County Fire Authority recommend and request that residents practice a home fire escape plan, making them prepared and therefore be more likely to survive a fire. And Brisbane and North County Fire Authority are dedicated to reducing the occurrence of home fires and associated deaths and injuries through public education and community outreach. And Brisbane residents are response, responsive to public education measures and are able to take personal steps to increase their safety from fire, especially in their homes. Whereas the 2015 Fire Prevention Week theme, Hear the Beep Where You Sleep, Every Bedroom Needs a Working Smoke Alarm, effectively serves to remind us that we need working smoke alarms to give us time to get out safely. Therefore, I, Terry O'Connell, Mayor of Brisbane, do here pray, proclaim October 2015 as Fire Prevention Month throughout this city, and I urge all of the people of Pacifica, Brisbane, and Brisbane to install smoke alarms in every bedroom outside each sleeping area and on every level of the home, including the basement, and to support the many public safety activities and efforts of North County Fire Authority during Fire Prevention Month 2015. And thank you very much. Thank you. Now tell us how we can all be safe besides <laughs> fire de smoke okay. detectors. Well, I'm in the, in the midst of time here. Um, First of all, I want to thank you very much for declaring October Fire Prevention Month. Uh, the month of October is a very busy month for the fire department. In addition to all the emergency alarms we're responding to and training and inspections, uh, our firefighters are, gonna, are out in the community educating the public about fire safety. And one segment of our community in particular is our school children. Our firefighters last week and this week have been going to every single elementary school in all three cities, talking with the children educating them about stop, drop, and roll. And again, this year's theme from NFPA here, the beep where you sleep, the importance of not only having just a smoke alarm in their home in the hallway, but having one in every bedroom of the house. That's the child's bedroom, their sister, brothers, their mom and dads. So really emphasizing that point, which is NFPA's theme, which we have adopted here in the North County Fire Authority. Uh, now, this weekend, uh, we're going to have some great events coming up. This Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., we'll be having our annual fire service day open houses, and our own Brisbane Station 81 will be open, along with the Bayshore Fire Station in Daly City on Martin Street. Um, our headquarters fire station on Gellert and Wembley will also be open, 
and Station 95 on Edgemont and Lincoln in Daly City will also be opened in addition to the Lindemar Fire Station uh, on Lindemar Boulevard in the city of Pacifica. So the, the stations will be open from 10 to 2. We invite the public to come in. Uh, firefighters will be there to teach about fire safety, some aspects of their job, answer any questions, and again, to teach the public about fire safety. So it will be from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, this Saturday. Any questions from the council? I think it's a good reminder when we set our clocks back that uh, that's when you change your batteries on your smoke detector. That, that is a, a good point. And one of the things that we're <clears throat> actually the fire service, one of the challenges about that is for years we've been telling people that um, with the laws that have been changed now, the new smoke alarms that are coming out have a 10 year battery, which means you don't have to change it for 10 years. But we still want people to test the smoke alarms. And they should be tested them at least once a month. So maybe the shift is for the ones that have the 10-year battery, please make sure you at least test those when you change your clocks and change your batteries. But there still are a consider considerable number of homes that still have the 9-volt battery smoke alarms in them. Uh, so we do want to make sure they are changing those batteries. And another thing, the, the newer homes that do have the 110-volt wired smoke alarms, sometimes there's a misconception that that's all you need. Those still need the 9-volt battery because if the power goes out to the house, it's that 9-volt battery in that 110-volt smoke alarm that's going to sound the alarm. So we still want to remind the community about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll be on, I just want, I had a question for staff. Um, so that open house event this Saturday, um, we've attended it in the past, my family and I, and found it very engaging, informative, and of course my kids love to ride on the fire truck. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that um, we can get something out on um, through the city's website and blog about that. I think Carolyn, Carolyn already okay. has put that Excellent. for us. So, yeah. Great. And Thank all three you. cities have posted on our website and the city's website okay. as well. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So that brings us to our consent calendar. These are to approve items. Um, by a single motion. Do I have any? Motion to approve the consent, consent calendar of items A, B, C, D, and E. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Another time that Kevin Fryer from the Mission Blue Series did not have to make a presentation, but sat here nicely yeah if i could madam mayor that was approval of the city council minutes of september 17th approval of resolution 2015-41 and 42 and um resolution 2015-43 which is grant agreements with california division of boating and waterway funding and award construction contract for bayshore boulevard uh, south sewer force main to underground and Randy, good job on getting that way under budget and uh, approved the co-sponsorship with Friends of the Brisbane Library. Yeah, and, and could if I Kevin add, since we mentioned, oh, sorry. Sorry, I was going to suggest if Kevin would like to say a few words about yeah, the upcoming concert series. Yeah, I was going to say that would be exactly the same thing. Plus, I uh, would invite you if you'd like to say something, but while you're, and I'm sure you will. So while you're coming up, I also wanted to point out that the cover photograph on the history book is Kevin Fryer's. Right. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor and members of the City Council. I did come prepared to just talk a little bit, and uh, uh, it gives me an opportunity to talk to people who are watching at home about the 12th season of Live at Mission Blue, which we are in the middle of putting together. Uh, in fact, I just came from a meeting of Best PTO, where we talked about uh, the school program. We are slated to do a school program again this year. We'll start with that. Uh, the group that we are bringing to the schools this year is San Francisco Guitar Quartet. And in the meeting with Best PTO, we talked about, and we'll see now, I've got to go home and, and uh, uh, talk to the, to, the, to the Guitar Quartet, but about also trying to expand that day and bring in uh, the middle school as well. So we may expand that a little bit further. So that, that program is really uh, in a state of flux. Um, then we're doing four programs, same as last year, uh, in addition to the, the school program. We open with the Bienvenue 
um, Forte Piano Trio, and they have added two additional guests to it. Uh, this is Eric Zivian and uh, Tanya Tompkins. They've been here before. They're adding Carla Moore and Jody Levitz. Both of them have been here before. The one person who hasn't is Monica Huggett, who is one of the great uh, British um, uh, violin virtuosi. When she's not concertizing around the world, she is teaching at the Juilliard School of Music. Uh, our second program is called Love Life, and it's uh, Anne Moss, soprano, and she is will be accompanied by Emile Milan, cellist, and Steve Bailey, piano. Uh, and there, I'm just they've given me their program that all of their music is 21st century. Uh, the oldest piece that they are, uh, that she is performing is a suite that was composed in 2013, and they're going to do a world premiere, which. Um, which is composed in this year. They're also doing a, a piece called Love Song Suites, which includes music by Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell. Uh, the third program is uh, w the slot that I always, I always look for emerging artists and give emerging artists a slot. These aren't, uh, uh, of course, amateurs by any means. These are, are musicians who are in the first decade out of the conservatory, getting their professional career going. Uh, and this is a duo. This is Allegra Chapman, pianist, and uh, Christina Lamp Lamprey, who is a cellist. And Allegra Chapman, I just might mention, she is going to perform here this weekend at oh, a house right. concert. Kevin she's, inspired me to she's host a part house of concert. That program. <laughs> uh, I heard her at a previous house concert. She, I would hate to guess how old she is, but I don't think she's quite 30 yet. She's just a brilliant pianist. Mm -hmm. And then the last program uh, uh, to counterbalance the 21st century music is going to be music from the 14th century by the ensemble, uh, by a, a group called Ensemble Alcatraz. Now, Ensemble Alcatraz is a medieval group that was a big deal in the 80s, in 1980s and 1990s. Uh, made lots of recordings. They were sort of pioneers in bringing this music back to life in the 20th century. Uh, they're performing a program of music from the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, which was not Spain and Portugal at that time. Uh, several members of this ensemble, uh, th this ensemble uh, then went apart, uh, broke apart. They, about 15 years ago, they are coming back together in a program that we're calling Reunion. Several of these individuals have performed at Mission Blue before, most notably uh, the harpist Cheryl, Cheryl Ann Fulton and uh, Madam Mayor, your favorite percussionist, uh, Peter Mond, who were part of this original group. So that's our, our season. We start in January. It runs through April, and uh, we're looking forward to our 12th season. Thank you. Thank you. It's Thank you. so nice that you're able to put this together and with that we're able to support the yeah. Well, and the it, art. it is so nice, uh, let me just say, it is so nice that uh, Mission Blue Center is here in Brisbane because it really is one of the region's fantastic uh, recital halls for this kind of music. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin, for bringing that to oh, Brisbane. Kevin, if you wouldn't mind just, just sharing a little bit more about uh, Lori's house concert. I was going to mention it, but you, you know about the... Well, uh, I so I I went to a house concert uh, last year in Palo Alto, and and it is uh, started by uh, Laura. Laura uh, Ganyan. Ganyan, yes. And Laura uh, played on our series last year on our emerging artist slot, and also our school program. She's a cellist, so I went to hear them at uh, at this house concert, and we got to talking afterwards, and. If you're a musician, you need to be an entrepreneur. You know, you can't sit at home and wait for the <laughs> phone to ring. It's just not going to happen. So I'm always interested in those young professionals who are doing their own caper, you know, figuring it out. And she certainly is one of them. Uh, and so I saw the house concert. It was very successful. It was really wonderful. And we got to talking. And then Lori had mentioned, you know, well, you know, I have a grand piano in my house, and uh, if you ever think about it, something we could do at my house. So I put the two of them together. I gave them an in introduction and stepped back, and now uh, we'll see that. Uh, yes, so it's going to be Saturday from 2 to 4. Um, we can probably fit about 30 people, and we've sold about 20 tickets, so we still have some left. Um, if anyone is interested, please contact me. It should be a real treat. We're going to have um, Laura on the cello. Uh, we'll also have a violin. Um, 
the piano, um, someone on voice, and I think a viola as yeah, well. It's five, big, it's five a fairly piece. big ensemble. Yeah. <laughs> five piece ensemble. It should be a really wonderful concert, and I'm happy to help share music in Brisbane, really, you know, from the comfort of one's home. It should be really special. So if you're interested, let me know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah sounds great. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. So that brings us to, sorry, uh, excuse me, brings us to new business item A to consider introduction of ordinance 601, waiving first reading and adding a new chapter to the Brisbane Municipal <coughs> Code, adding a new section concerning city council salaries and repealing ordinance 281. Staff report, please. Yep, Madam Mayor and Council, um, back in September, the City Council um, reviewed a uh, salary survey that was presented to us um, by our consultant who's doing um, this kind of work, uh, Hay Hurst and Associates. Um, the last time the City Council uh, adjusted the salary was in 1982, some 33 years ago. The council by law could raise its salary um, as high as $437.25. It chose instead to raise it to $400. Um, the salary survey that we had um, conducted um, actually showed the council's salary in Brisbane to be the lowest amongst the comparable cities and the median salary of uh, $499. So again, the direction was for salary that's less than the median. Um, if the council approves the first reading tonight, the second reading will be on your November 5th agenda. Um, that will make it go into effect 30 days um, hence <laughs> on December 5th, uh, timely for the uh, seating of the new city council in um, December 8th. Thank uh, you. Madam Mayor, I hope I have the opportunity to introduce the ordinance since I will be the only person who will not be affected by it. So this is going to take us from four cents an hour to 16 cents? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> yes. Still below minimum wage. Yeah. Far below. Yeah. So, it, are, it, so you're making a motion to introduce? I'd like to introduce ordinance number 601, yes. And second. We have a second. And is there any discussion? And are there, I see no slips that the public wanted to speak on this. So with that, do I, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposing? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ray. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that item B is going to be our um, more um, Robust conversation tonight. Item B for the consideration of ordinance, introduction of ordinance 602. And I would like to say, ask if we could take a five minute break before we get into this, if that is amenable to the council and the public. I would appreciate that. Okay.